It's been nearly two weeks since Richard Allen was charged with the murders of Abby Williams and Libby German in Delphi, Indiana. And now Allen is asking for a public defender. I'm Anjanette Levy, and welcome back to Law and Crime Sidebar Podcast. There are still so many questions surrounding this case. We've been following it for you for the last couple of weeks, and documents about this case remain sealed. I find that highly unusual. Usually you get some type of little nugget from a probable cause statement or something to that effect. Not in this case. The documents are sealed, and now Richard Allen has actually been moved to a secret location. He's been in two county jails. Now he's in an undisclosed location where he's being held and he's written a letter to the court asking for a public defender because he didn't realize how expensive it was going to be to retain private counsel. So joining me to talk about all of these developments are two people who've been following this case for a really long time. They are Anya Kane and Kevin Greenlee, and they host the Murder Sheet podcast. Anya and Kevin, welcome back to Sidebar. Thanks for coming back. Thanks for having us. Let's start, first of all, with this letter. And I just, I want to read it for the viewers and the listeners so they know what exactly it says. Uh, Richard Allen wrote this to the Carroll Circuit Court. And he wrote, in the cause listed above, I, Richard M. Allen, hereby throw myself at the mercy of the court. I am begging to be provided with legal assistance and a public defender or whatever help is available. There are some kind of grammatical errors in this letter. At my initial hearing on August 28th, 2022, I asked to find representation for myself. However, at the time, I had no clue how expensive it would be just to talk to someone. I also did not realize what my wife and I's immediate financial situation was going to be. We've both been forced to immediately abandon employment, myself due to incarceration, and my wife for her personal safety. She has had to abandon our house for her own safety. What little reserve there is will fail to even maintain the original residence. And he says, again, he's throwing himself on the mercy of the court. So what did you all make of this letter? Obviously, we know that lawyers are incredibly expensive and getting a, a lawyer for a double homicide case would be very expensive. So what were your thoughts when you first read this letter? Um, for us, I think it filled in some gaps in our understanding of the situation. We have long been interested and somewhat concerned with the fact that uh, Mr. Allen does not seem to have any sort of legal counsel, and this confirms that. But it also explains somewhat that his, at his initial hearing, he opted to find his own attorney um, and pay out of pocket for that. And basically, from the White County uh, jail where he wrote this letter and, and sent it out from, he had some sort of revelation that that was not going to work out and that he was going to need to seek a, a public defender instead. Now, he's since been moved from the White County Jail and is now somewhere in the Department of Corrections uh, within Indiana. But this does kind of tell us maybe some of the thought process and some of the delay behind why he does not yet have an attorney. Mm -hmm. Kevin, I wonder what you make, uh, too, of the judge who was initially on the case, uh, Benjamin Diner, recusing himself. Judge Fran Gall, who's been on the bench for a long time, has been appointed to handle the case by the Indiana Supreme Court. She uh, has a lot of accolades, it sounds like, from my reading of about her. So what do you make of the judge just kind of punting this case? I think part of the reason he said he did was because there was a demand for so much information from the public and things of that nature. But this is a case where it's shrouded in secrecy. I find it very odd because we usually get some little inkling of information about what led them to somebody as a suspect, and we're not getting that yet in this case. Yes, usually by this point, we would have a look at the probable cause affidavit, which would lay out at least the basics of the case against the arrested man. That's not been released in this case. So going on two weeks later, uh, Alan doesn't have an attorney. We don't have any idea of what evidence there is against him. And we're not even sure where exactly he is being held within the state of Indiana. So all of these things together make a lot of people very uneasy. Uh, behind the scenes, some attorneys tell us that this sort of thing is completely unprecedented. And it seems a bit risky to be doing unprecedented things when the stakes on a case are as big as they are in this case. And, and to answer the question about Judge Diener, that certainly is an unusual move for the judge to, as you said, punt uh, this off to another judge. Uh, there were some communications uh, with, with Judge Diener that he sort of seemingly inadvertently CC'd a media outlet on where he expressed feeling overwhelmed. 
um, in a transfer order that he wrote, allowing the prisoner to be uh, transferred, essentially. He also sort of played the part uh, of media critic, where he started talking about the, uh, the, the public's bloodlust for information. That struck us as somewhat an unusual tone, especially in a transfer order uh, for a judge to take. And I think both of us um, sort of were getting the sense that maybe there was a feeling of being overwhelmed and not being able to handle this case emotionally. And um, so I think it's good that a respected and, you know, a, a judge that's certainly accustomed to high profile cases. Uh, this is a judge who presided over one of the trials regarding the Richmond Hill explosion, which was a very big case in Indiana. So um, having someone with that experience, with that ability come in is something that we're very heartened by for sure. Yeah, the bloodlust thing, uh, you know, <laughs> that doesn't surprise me to hear somebody say something like that. But no, I think people just want some basic information. I think that's what people are looking for. Usually we get something. Have you heard anything behind the scenes about why this is being kept so secret? I, I can kind of understand, oh, let's keep the location secret uh, of where this guy is. You know, people are feeling very passionately about this case and you just want to take all the precautions you can to keep the defendant safe. But keeping these records sealed like this, and I understand there will be a hearing later this month on it, but keeping these records about a probable cause statement sealed just seems incredibly, incredibly over the top. Yeah, it's, it's definitely very unusual. I think we can kind of see both sides of it a little bit. On the one hand, I think investigators feel that the investigation is far from over and that there are currently a lot of balls in the air and they don't want any of that jeopardized by the public or, you know, possible other parties in this knowing what they know. So on that hand, we definitely understand everyone wants justice for Libby and Abby. Everyone wants to prioritize that. Um, and then on the other hand, as a, as a media outlet, as, as media figures ourselves, we want that information and we feel that when a person is accused of such a serious crime, the public should be able to have an understanding of how this came about and, and be informed and have some spotlight be shown on that. And I think where we sort of stand is that there's probably a nuanced um, understanding that could be had here where perhaps a redacted version of the probable cause affidavit is released that maybe redacts key uh, sensitive information, but allows the public to have more of an understanding of what exactly is going on here. It really leads me to believe, and I, I'm just speculating here, obviously, like the rest of us are, but it leads me to believe, maybe wrongly, that there could be something in there that points to somebody else. We've talked about that before, how they haven't ruled out the possibility that there could be more arrests coming. Are you hearing anything reliable about that being a distinct possibility? We're certainly hearing behind the scenes that they do not believe the investigation is over. And they are trying to see if there are any connections between Alan and anyone else. And so that's when they're asking for tips from the public where they, where they mean is they really want people who have had experiences with Richard Allen to come forward and say what they know. Uh, they really want to continue with this investigation. And their fear is that there is some information in the probable cause affidavit that perhaps, you know, the names of witnesses or things like that that would compromise their ability to do the investigation. Do we think that his voice, Richard Allen, and we have no way of knowing this unless somebody tells us, that his voice is the one that was on the phone uh, that was recorded that day? I mean, do we know anything about this? Our understanding is that investigators are confident that uh, Richard Allen, or that what their, their theory of the case is, that he was the man on the bridge. That's what the accusation sort of seemingly is based around, as yeah. far as we understand it. Um, as for our personal opinion, uh, I, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable saying uh, he's obviously innocent until proven guilty. Um, that being said, we did recently release an episode where we spoke with people who grew up with him, um, you know, who went to the same high school and sort of knew him throughout the course of their childhood. And they, one of the women said when she listened to the bridge guy audio, uh, she got chills because it sounded like him, but she was not saying that it was definitely him, just that it was not dissimilar. Sure. And of course, 
we have to remember he is innocent until proven guilty. He has the same rights as anybody else uh, charged with a crime in this country. So I guess we just wait and see and uh, look to see whether these documents are unsealed at the hearing later this month. I'm sure he will get a public defender from the court if he qualifies for one. They will appoint one for him and that hearing should move forward. Yeah, that would be my assumption as well. Certainly from behind the scenes, uh, what we're hearing is that there are concerns everywhere about him not having an attorney. Because when someone faces charges of any magnitude, certainly a magnitude of, of this level, you really need legal representation to make sure that your rights are being protected. And it would really be the worst of all possible worlds if there was a situation where they got some information from Mr. Allen, but in the process violated his legal rights, and so that information could be potentially inadmissible. So we're confident they're going to do everything they can to get him a lawyer. Well, Anya Kane and Kevin Greenlee, we know that you will continue to follow it. We will continue to follow it as well. It's a very important case, and people deserve answers uh, about what happened to Abby and Libby. Thanks for coming on. Thank thanks, you so much. Thanks for having us. And that's it for this edition of Law and Crime Sidebar Podcast. It is produced by Logan Harris and Sam Goldberg. Bobby Zoki is our YouTube manager. Alyssa Fisher handles our bookings. And Kiara Bronson does our social media. You can listen to and download Sidebar on Apple, Spotify, Google, and wherever else you get your podcasts. And of course, you can always watch it on Law and Crime's YouTube channel. I'm Anjanette Levy, and we will see you next time.